Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. I'd like to call this informational meeting of Tuesday, July 20th, 2021 to order. Our first order of business today is council remarks, and I'd like to go first today. And Denise, I'd like you to stand up, please. Denise, I want to take a moment to recognize Assistant City Clerk Denise Tucker for her recent earning, distingu earning the distinction of Athenian Fellow through the International Institute of Municipal Clerks. The fellowship is a result of five years of hard work and collaboration with other clerks across the region and to explore leadership principles and practice. It also shows an ongoing commitment to continued professional development and self-improvement. In fact, Denise is the very first Athenian fellow in the state of South Dakota. And I am happy to present Denise with a certificate of recognition for her achievement. Thank you for all you do. All right, now that I fumbled my way through that, are there any other council remarks? <laughs> Councilor Kiley. Um, thank you very much. It was my pleasure to participate in a number of events this, this past uh, weekend. Uh, the first was the 31 year anniversary celebration of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and I was asked to speak and uh, boy, after I sat through the first four speakers, I thought, boy, I came woefully pre ill prepared for this because the people that preceded me just knocked it out of the park. But uh, it was a nice little celebration. Uh, and one of the th things that uh, was mentioned by one of the other speakers is that uh, individuals with disabilities uh, make up the largest uh, minority group in the U.S. making up, I believe it was 17 percent. And quite frankly, my personal opinion is I think they're far uh, overlooked. And uh, uh, in some of my remarks, I've mentioned how we can, uh, ADA actually benefits all of us, not just individuals with disabilities, but each and every one of us, especially uh, the city of Sioux Falls as well as the businesses, because it provides opportunities to those that uh, need just a little assistance so that they can contribute to their uh, community and uh, they contribute a lot. And I do believe that they are overlooked in that capacity. They're, they're an untapped resource to some of the workforce development issues that we are experiencing here today. So that was, that was and it was a beautiful evening. We were, we were down on the river walk outside of uh, Mr. Jeff Scherzlick's uh, big boom place. So that was, that was fun. And then at, at one o'clock Saturday afternoon, attended a, uh, a bridge naming ceremony for Master Sergeant Jeremy Bruman. And this was uh, a state bridge that was named. So uh, Assistant Deputy Director of Veterans Affairs uh, was there leading that particular ceremony and uh, it's always nice to honor service men and women who have paid the ultimate price with just a little bit of recognition. Uh, and so even a number of Jeremy's former colleagues were there and it was a very touching ceremony. And then that evening, uh, there was a, unfortunately it came as rather late invite to, to us, um, but there was uh, at the Military Alliance, was a tribute to fallen soldiers. Uh, and that uh, was the brainchild of an individual by the name of Warren Williamson. Uh, they reside in Oregon. And originally they were formed, it's a group of motorcycle riders that uh, recognize fallen soldiers. Uh, and they originally got together to recognize uh, men and women, again, who had paid the ultimate price just in the state of Oregon. And then they decided it would be good to take this show on the road. And so they left Eugene just a little over a week ago now. And they're on their way to uh, Arlington National Cemetery for the final uh, ceremony. But it's a group of motorcycle riders. And uh, one of them tows a small trailer with a 
eternal f flame. They light it in Eugene and they pull it behind their motorcycle all the way to the cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. And it's never extinguished until they reach the cemetery. But along the way, they stop and honor 70 uh, uh, soldiers and, and families uh, of those soldiers. And it just so happened. I'd like to say that city clerk Tom Greco was uh, uh, accompanied me to this event, and both of them, or both of us, were very impressed with how professionally it was put on. It was just one of the nicest events I've ever attended, quite frankly. But um, one of the soldiers honored was Rob Rolfing, the son of former city councilor Rex Rolfing. So it was, it was something I was glad that I had the opportunity to attend. And I would encourage if, if you ever get a chance, if they come through our area, I would encourage anybody. It was open to the public. I would encourage all of you to attend too. It was just, it was a great event. They left bright and early that next morning, actually did another. They, they drove to the Southern Sioux Falls and honored yet another family that had elected to have their own private ceremony. And then they were uh, off to Sioux City. So anyway, that's it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Councilor Erickson? Not my news, but um, you all know I'm an open book, and so um, I think most of us maybe got a message. But last night at 8.34, uh, Councilor Jensen and his wife Nikki welcomed their second baby boy, George William. Um, so congratulations to Councilor Jensen and their family for uh, welcoming another little baby in their family. I, I don't personally know the last time uh, actually, a city councilor had a child while serving still. I'm sure it's been quite some time. I know there's been lots of grandkids, but the last time they were actually elected and had a, a child at the same time was, um, we know how busy we are, and so he'll be extra busy with that new baby. So anyways, just wanted to share his news and say congratulations. So that's it. Thank you. When I received the text, I assumed it was a misspelling. I assumed the little boy would be Richard Curtis, but <laughs> I guess that didn't happen. Any other councillor remarks? Seeing none, we're going to jump right into the most dynamic presentation we get every month and do our monthly financials. Sean Pritchard. Good afternoon, councillors. I'm here to present today the June financial report. Um, this will uh, be the last report until we pause after the uh, budget hearings of next month. So we'll come back in September with the, the next round, but we'll for a formal presentation, you'll receive a copy of the, the July financial report uh, via email. Uh, I may sound a little bit like a broken record, and I will try to be uh, somewhat interesting in this presentation, but it is much the same of what you've seen in the previous presentations. Uh, there hasn't been any major material changes in terms of the financial condition or the economic conditions of the city. We're seeing a slow labor force growth, uh, escalating inflation, uh, record permits continuing throughout this year, um, increasing sales and entertainment taxes and expenses that are coming in with an expectation. So I guess if I were to summarize the entirety of this, uh, those would be the, the takeaways. Uh, that said, I'll hopefully at least provide a little bit of new context to some of the things that we do have time uh, to talk about this afternoon. Uh, the first is, is the labor force. And again, uh, the positive thing here to see some growth here. We're up about 8% over the low we had during the pandemic. So we are seeing some growth there. If you look at where we currently sit, we're about 3.3% above the average of where we were in 2019. So again, we're seeing uh, labor force now and employment actually growing uh, above and beyond where we were in that pandemic to the pre-pandemic stage that we had. Uh, as far as unemployment remains uh, low and comparative to where we were before the pandemic at two and a half percent, we remain about a half percent below the state of South Dakota and about three percent below the, the rest of the nation. Uh, we tend to be tracking very closely there. Uh, inflation uh, is probably one of the more interesting things and, and maybe a topic of discussion. Uh, we certainly had at the last council uh, presentation here uh, and one that uh, is maybe getting a little bit more media attention as it continues to escalate. Uh, we had about a 5.4% inflation rate uh, for June over June of 2020. Uh, that's up from 5% for the previous month. And some of our staff dug into these numbers a little bit, and I think it was somewhat interesting and I think provides some context to it. Um, there's a couple of things that are driving that, particularly over the last couple of months when you're seeing those 5 and 5.4%. Uh, two areas, one, uh, gasoline uh, for motor vehicles 
is driving it, and to the extent of it's contributing about 1% of the inflation rate there you seeing. So the other one, interestingly, is used cars. And uh, over the last month, they're up 45% uh, over the previous year, and so you've seen that escalate. And that alone, used cars, is contributing 1% to that inflation rate. So if you were to take out those two particular pieces, you'd be looking at an inflation rate of about 3.2% overall. So uh, what's totally driving that, obviously, fuel prices are coming back from some of the lows they had from last year. I think probably some stimulus payments are um, driving some of the impacts we're seeing in some of the used car markets and as well as supply chain issues. Uh, but it's really been in the used car market and not necessarily in the new car market. So uh, gives you a, a little bit of a flavor there. You can see these by industry, of course. We see energy prices, again, driving that inflation. Food prices, which were higher last year, uh, are starting to show some uh, mediation here as we go into this current year. Uh, building permits continue to be uh, moving forward at a record pace. Uh, across the board, primarily, uh, again, new residential values are up about $60 million over last year at this time. Uh, new commercial values, which includes the multifamily sector, uh, so new commercial is up 84 million, but the uh, multifamily portion is up 87 million. So where you're seeing some down, a little bit of down in other areas, it's being made up for in the multifamily. Uh, the other thing interesting to point out is uh, uh, commercial additions and remodeling is up 60 million. And so while you're not seeing a lot of uh, generic commercial projects yet being permitted this year, we're seeing a lot of additions and remodels being added to uh, some of those building valuations that you are seeing. And of course, uh, we keep close eye on those uh, residential units. And uh, to date, we've had 17, uh, more than 1,700 units that have been permitted in the city of Sioux Falls, uh, driven in large part by uh, some record-breaking numbers on the multifamily side. But interesting to look at this, uh, we've had more permits issued for housing in the first six months of this year than we had in the last two years combined for the first six months. So it gives a little bit of context to the nature of the permit activity that we're seeing, uh, certainly on that residential side. As far as sales tax collections, uh, we've seen some fairly significant increases as you're looking at on a comparative basis to last year, uh, but that uh, isn't always telling because we had some dramatic decreases last year that we're working our way back from. So you can see on a month over month basis, we were up 28% on sales taxes compared to June of last year. Uh, probably the better uh, basis of comparison as we talked about is 2019, which is a normalized year. But even within that uh, comparison, we were up over 16%. And so that's really kind of an 8% year-over-year increase over a normalized year. And so we are seeing really uh, fairly strong activity. If you look at kind of the industry side here, I'm going to kind of piece ahead here. Uh, but there hasn't been any major changes as we look in the industry level. But you're seeing uh, a lot of retail and consumer goods in that 15 to 20% range over 2019. So you look at department stores up 23%, lumber continuing to be up. Of course, there's some inflation embedded into that. Eating establishments up 16%. Uh, remote retailer sales, that's uh, not a good comparison because we didn't have a basis of comparison back in 2019. But if you compare it to 2020, which would be a pretty good basis, we're up about 20%. So uh, not as much as we used to be up, but we really, you know, we've now had a year of these kind of re remote retailer sales to make comparisons to, and it's still, you're still seeing things very robust in that area. You're seeing strong activity in the wholesale trades. Agriculture was up, manufacturing was up. So everything across the board was good, but I think you're seeing some, still seeing those stimulus impacts there that uh, we'll be watching to see how much longer they continue. On the entertainment tax side, again, uh, up 67%. Nah, so. We are coming off a bad month of June of negative 35% last year, so it's going to look unusually large. If you compare to 2019, we're up 8%. So not as strong as our sales tax growth, but it's still pretty, pretty solid growth. Uh, if you look at it, restaurants compared to two years ago, restaurants are up 15%. If you look at lodging, they're still down about 2%. Uh, you look at drinking establishments, they're up 10% or about 9% over where we were two years ago. So a big portion of what we're seeing for activity in the entertainment tax is driven by a recovering lodging uh, industry, but restaurants drive that. We had $6 million more in revenue over two years ago uh, in taxable sales uh, within the entertainment tax. So not sales taxes, but taxable sales. Five and a half million of that was generated by the restaurant industry. So that really truly is driving where we're seeing happening with the entertainment tax side. Um, on the lodging piece, um, again, you're seeing uh, dramatic increases there, 252%. Uh, 
uh, over last year at this time, but we were down 60%. So if you look at it and you compare it to two years ago, we're up 16%. But that's a, uh, I, I would say, I'd give a caveat there that we are still dealing with that lodging audit issue, and I don't think that was in that number. So if you back that back in, it's pretty much break even on the lodging, but that's a really positive place to be uh, in comparison to what we've seen in the past. Give you an idea about where, where revenue per average rooms are for Sioux Falls compared to our counterparts, our similar communities. Uh, year to date, we're um, at about $52 per average room. Uh, if you were to compare that to the city of Sioux Falls, they were at $31 per average room. What does that mean? Well, if you have a 100 room hotel over a 365 day year, that's a difference of about $750,000. The reason why I talk about things like that is because policies that our state and our city, our city put forward matter to our hotel and our restaurant industries. And, and certainly, you can see it in the numbers uh, for both Sioux Falls and Rapid City in total. On the bid tax side, um, this one we are up, uh, again, fairly significantly when you compare us to last year when we were down very significantly. Uh, if you look at where we were compared to two years ago, uh, we're just slightly behind where we were um, at that point. So we're kind of in that break-even point when it comes to lodging. If you look at our occupancies year to date, Sioux Falls leads all of our peers at about uh, 50, almost 59% occupancy. The next closest one is Rapid City. And uh, again, compare that to St. Paul, they're hovering around 38% occupancy year to date on average. So uh, we certainly would always like to be doing better, but we are thankful, I think, for where we are at uh, in the present year. As far as revenues for the city, uh, overall, uh, with uh, improving sales tax at activity. You can see if you take out any and all lo local government assistance one-time dollars, so we can make a good comparison. Uh, we've collected about 54% of our budget year to date. Uh, that compares to 49% at this time last year. Again, with recovering sales taxes, property taxes are up, but that's probably, again, more of a timing issue, not indicative uh, that that will kind of come closer to budget numbers as we continue on through the year. And then on the expenditure side, we're about 39% expended. Uh, compared to 40% last year, so we're in a good place there. The, the largest increases you'll see are in police and parks. Uh, those are driven by wages, which uh, overall we're up in expenses about $2.9 million, driven probably by those two categories. And as you recall, we didn't have a lot of seasonal and part-time wages for parks last year, so uh, that's a natural increase that you see there. It's coming more back to normal, what we would see uh, coming into the summer season. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have in regard to June financials. Counselors, questions? Counselor Kiley. Really no questions other than uh, thank you for all the information that you sent out ahead of time on, on Friday. I appreciated going through that. And at first I was looking at, God, why are, why are liquor stores and grocery stores down, but then I remembered, of course, last year at that time, people couldn't go out to eat, that they had to go to grocery stores uh, for foodstuffs and liquor stores for important beverages to consume while you're isolating yourself. So it made a lot of sense, but it, it was good to see the rebound that a lot of our, uh, our entertainment industry is making and the hospitality industry is making and others. So very informative. Thank you. Other questions? Councilor Starr? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director, we're getting, I'm, I'm hoping we've gotten a little better guidance of, of what the federal government's asking us to do with the ARPA funds and shuttered facilities and um, things. Can you give us just a, a little bit of a highlight of, you know, it's been a month or two since we've kind of updated. I'm hoping there's more clarity than there was the last time we really discussed in small groups. So. Are there some highlights that you want to touch on? Sure. Um, so we're continuing to participate in various opportunities for education, especially as it relates to the American Recovery uh, Plan, uh, our rescue plan. Uh, and so uh, we're getting more educated in that. We've certainly had conversations with our auditors, counterparts at the state, our county we continue to meet with on a monthly basis as well as we're continuing uh, to both become more educated in regard to this. I think we're getting more comfortable with where our revenue loss calculation is, and that's kind of driving in many respects how we're able to deploy those funds. And so with that now coming together, in fact, the staff was meeting here uh, before we came over uh, to really kind of detail out what our comfort level is going to be on that revenue loss calculation uh, so we can make some uh, proposals in terms of how those funds could be utilized. 
uh, as well as uh, continuing to uh, work with the council and some of the priorities that are coming forward and, and also the, the administrative priorities that need to be funded uh, coming into uh, some of the growth that we're seeing here in the community. So I think we're in a, getting into a better place in terms of trying to align all those uh, and make sure we're meeting every, everything, every, all the needs uh, to the maximum potential that we can. Uh, we did receive our first half of the uh, American Recovery Plan Act dollars as of last Friday, which is about $12.5 million. We've set it into a separate revenue account. You wouldn't see those in these financials, but they will appear uh, next month in their own separate fund that we will track separately. Can you back up just a second? Tell me about the revenue loss calculator and what it measures or how it measures it and, and how it really affects well, what we're trying and, to do. And that's the challenging part is, you know, we've, we've looked at different ways that one would calculate. So you have to look at it on, on an enterprise-wide basis. They wouldn't let you target specific revenue sources. So just because we lost entertainment taxes doesn't mean that we could assume revenue loss to the city. We had to look at all things. And certain things were excluded such as certain utilities were excluded, but then other utilities were included. The biggest question mark for us was truly about some of our concessionaire or management agreements and whether they would be included. Uh, there was a question about you know, the fact that we do not operate internally our event center uh, as well as our golf courses to whether we could incorporate their gross revenues into our calculation and making sure that we were comfortable with that. And I think we're at a point where we are comfortable including those as part of it, and those are important uh, items because they took dramatic decreases at, obviously at the event center and the convention center due to closure and then the pandemic impacts. So in the reason why we care about that revenue calculation is it opens up more opportunities outside of some of the more uh, specific uh, things you're allowed to do with the funds. So you're allowed to use it for more general government services, which makes it a lot more flexible for us. Perfect. Thank you. That helps. Councilor Neitzer. Um, can you remind me where we're at with the Public Safety Center in terms of uh, bonding and, and getting uh, detailed design and all of that stuff? Sure. Um, so we are con continuing to proceed forward that uh, in getting completed with the, constru uh, the construction documents. I think they're still preparing to bid in the September time frame. Um, so we're watching that very closely. Obviously, we're uh, cognizant of potential for some of the es price escalations that have occurred in the marketplace as a result of that. Uh, and so we're, we're monitoring that, but also uh, we'll be talking with you about ways that we can maybe hedge against some of that, ensuring that we're, we're able to secure most of the, the planned things that we wanted to see achieved with that public safety training facility. So that will be a topic of conversation here as we go into the next month. Thank you. I just have one comment. It's interesting that as lumber prices have come back on the wholesale level, we really haven't seen that on the retail level yet with the lumber prices. I anticipate that to continue to go back to somewhere above where it was in 2019, certainly not the high that we've seen. But it's surprising to me that used cars is now the height item that has gone up. Thank goodness I am not in the market for that. No further comments. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank Always you. Always very informative. And I, and I do appreciate your ability to, to answer our questions after you come out with this earlier, late last week and through the weekend and, and to always be available. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. All right, our next presentation, I'm sure it cannot be as dynamic, but I'm sure they're gonna try, is investing in long-term care facilities. Tom Huber. Good afternoon. Tom Huber with the finance office and today the facilities office as well. So as Sean and the team have taken on, you know, more of uh, Cody and, and Tim and everybody has taken on more of the financial part of it. They've let me dibble dabble a little bit in the facilities world. And it's been actually uh, very, very challenging and very fun for me to, as, as learning a little bit about everything that goes on in Jeremy and Pat's world. So, and just to kind of get started, in 2021, we did establish the centralized uh, facilities as an internal service fund, like the fleet and technology funds that we had before. Uh, and so today we wanna to just provide you with an update on how we are uh, planning to continue investing in the long-term care of our facilities. And if there's one point that I could leave you with today, uh, it's right here at the beginning. Um, 
we're running a marathon, not a sprint, uh, in caring for the, the maintenance uh, and growing of our city facility infrastructure. Uh, the race requires good planning, uh, a very balanced approach, and uh, being adaptable as circumstances change. We never know what's gonna happen, and that's one of the things that's just intrigued me is the service calls, the type of service calls that we get on a regular basis, when, where it's, it's everything, and, and uh, the way the team responds to that has, has been phenomenal. So to start out, I uh, thought it was important to discuss what is centralized facilities. Uh, centralized facilities allows us to take a coordinated approach to managing the care and maintenance uh, and growth of our city facility infrastructure. To provide some context uh, as to what 39 primary facilities and 890,000 square feet looks like, uh, tried to give you a, a list of some of our, our primary facilities, including the core facilities, uh, this building, Carnegie Town Hall, City Hall, uh, City Center, and then we have our fire stations, our law enforcement center, our libraries, our main campus facilities at streets and parks, and throughout our utilities. Each of this, these facilities, of course, plays a vital role in allowing us to provide important services to the public. If you look at each one of these facilities, uh, each one has many moving parts. Uh, beyond just the normal exterior and interior that, that you might see. There are roof systems that uh, need, need to be replaced every now and then and uh, repaired. There are large apparatus doors, uh, generators, HVAC units for both heating and air conditioning, electrical, plumbing, uh, sidewalks, curb and gutter, parking lots, and landscaping, just to name a few of all the pieces that go into this. Uh, there's a lot of needs that need to be cared for and maintained, and, uh, but what we do have going in our favor is that we have identified what needs to be done, and we're taking that coordinated and collaborative approach to ensuring that we properly manage these facilities for our departments. So who is Centralized Facilities? Um, it all starts with a great team, and we have one of the best. Uh, we have... Uh, Jeremy Williams leads our, our facilities maintenance team, has nine members on that team. And our focus with this team has been adding uh, skilled trades positions. We added an electrician earlier this year uh, uh, to our, our team. And we've also promoted two highly uh, qualified building maintenance workers to facilities carpenters to, to meet these specific trades needs. And we are looking at focusing on the trades even further as we go forward, whether it's HVAC, possibly cement and hardscaping, plumbing. Jer we do, Jeremy is a licensed plumber, so we, we do have a lot of that taken care of, but uh, there's just a lot of needs out there and it requires a skilled trades team to provide those uh, for those needs. Pat Wood leads our custodial team. Uh, this photo up here is the, is the custodial team and their shout out from last year for providing excellent service and in keeping our buildings uh, not only clean, but safe throughout the COVID pandemic. In, make, in addition to making sure that things are clean and well cared for, we're also working with this team to become our building ambassadors where they identify building needs before departments have to put in work tickets. There are eyes and ears that on, on the ground uh, that can identify some of those needs so that we can make sure they're on our list before uh, they become problematic. So one of the first things we've done recently is, is kind of asked how should centralized facilities operate? Every now and then you want to sit down and ask yourself the question, you know, how should we be doing what we're doing? And so we asked ourselves these questions. How do we improve and maximize our building infrastructure? Uh, and that included evalu evaluating the use of underutilized space um, to evaluate, repair, renovate, or move. Uh, and when we look at... Uh, Maintaining our buildings, and yes, I said I said move. Uh, it may not be often, but sometimes it may be to our advantage to move locations. Uh, demands and needs change. Um, and prior to just pouring a bunch of money into to either a new building or making expensive repairs to an old building, we need to engage in those discussions. And uh, sometimes the capital cost of building new uh, may be much less than operating in two locations or, uh, 
or in dealing with the amount of repair and maintenance that might be needed on a facility. We also asked the question, how do we prioritize these needs across all the departments of the city? Each one of them has facility needs and how do, how do we pr uh, prioritize those needs and make sure we're addressing the most critical and important uh, pieces first. How do we uh, promote partnerships and share facilities to increase our building effectiveness? And, and then how do we anticipate and make the right decisions for our facilities as the city grows? And upon asking all of these questions, we, we kind of developed some key priorities for the next few years that kind of drive how, how we budget and how we plan our activities. First is what I've mentioned before, uh, priority of building a team of trades professionals. Uh, these positions allow us to not only better respond to the ongoing needs, uh, it also helps develop a core ownership uh, of our various assets. Having people on our team who understand e how each building is wired, plumbed, how the heating and air conditioning works in, in that particular building uh, is, is, a, is a big win. We then complement this team with outside professionals. There's just too much work to ever consider that we'll have a team the size that's needed to take care of all of, all of our facility needs. Uh, this direction is already pr uh, providing big dividends as we're able to, to just do a lot of these projects on our own, not having to wait for, for a contractor to, to uh, uh, respond and to uh, fix it. We're able to just do it ourselves and uh, get on to the next project. Second, we continue to our centralization efforts of managing our facility systems across the city, uh, making great strides in learning how we can better serve our department partners so they can do, do their jobs better, and we maximize talents on both teams. Third, uh, is continuing to, continuing to be proactive in, in these long-term discussions on, on asset management, on what needs to be done uh, and what new facilities are considered and what major repairs and renovations are needed to, to old facilities. I'll discuss the last two priorities, uh, coordinating our approach to establishing sustainable funding uh, in the next few slides. So first, when we look at uh, carefully prioritizing and co coordinating our approach and everything we do to managing our facilities is, 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 a, is that one of those key priorities. All facility space is valuable space and it's expensive to maintain or to add square footage. So the first thing we do is maximize the space that we, that we have uh, to deliver public services. We strive to be collaborative in sharing space whenever possible. Just recently, uh, we opened the libraries and some park locations up to, as break and report to work locations uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic, pandemic for other departments to, to stop. And, co-utilize those spaces uh, that were, were not being used at the time to deliver public services. Um, Fleet also continue, continues to expand their reach by co-locating services at outlying locations to better serve their customers. And those examples just kind of give you a flavor for the type of opportunities that we have to share and to work together to better utilize our facilities. We also want to make sure that our footprint uh, expands appropriately as the city grows. Uh, this doesn't always mean building an entirely new building, renovating and expanding our current space uh, plays an important role in accommodating growth in services uh, and workforce as the city grows. We have uh, substantially completed a design for renovating and expanding the main office, uh, locker room and report to work space at the uh, streets campus. A design is also underway uh, for renovation and expansions at the Park Shop campus. Both of these facilities, uh, the street campus main building was uh, constructed in 1987, the parks in 1995. And before we go in and start uh, ripping up, just taking care of a floor or moving a few walls or expanding locker rooms, uh, it's, it's, it's more prudent often to just go in and look at a complete renovation plan that will take you into the next 20 years instead of piecemealing it together and never getting to where you really need to be. Uh, finally, we always want to make sure that our facilities create a positive employee experience and for spaces where customers visit, a, a very uh, a great uh, customer experience. 
to help us in identifying these uh, and prioritizing our facility investments, uh, we completed two comprehensive condition assessments. One was in 2016 for most of the city buildings and the second in 2020 that we just completed and that was for a few, centra uh, few centralized uh, buildings but also mainly was uh, primarily focused on park assets uh, including golf, the golf course and zoo. And that was a big study and identified a lot of assets across the park system. These, these assessments provided a very detailed inventory of our facility assets. Uh, we doc they documented uh, their current conditions and provided some guidance as to remaining service life in addition to rough cost estimates uh, to help us plan into the future. A very valuable part of these studies was also to provide us with a component inventory for each facility uh, in an exportable format that will allow us to use that data or has allowed us to use that data to populate our asset management system. Something that once we fully uh, utilize will be extremely valuable in helping us manage our city facilities. What these assessments did not do though is give us the effectiveness of, of each of our facilities in meeting today's service needs. Um, and as well as the impact that growth is having on our facility needs. That is, that's where the collaboration with each department comes into play. So what did we learn from these assessments? Uh, overall, I would say that uh, uh, first we learned that uh, what, what should be at the top of our list. So we learned some of the critical things that really needed to be looked at. A lot of them were already known and we were looking at them, but it provided the documentation and, and gave us a, a, a window, an independent window into what should come first. I think our, uh, our team and the departments would agree that our facilities are in generally good condition. However, when you begin to take a look deeper at all the moving part, parts, it's going to take a big effort uh, keeping them this way as our buildings age and our city grows. There are some facilities where aging is more than just a physical condition, as we talked a little bit about earlier. The demands and needs for facility space change. Uh, we need to continue to modernize and expand appropriately to meet the, these changing service needs. Uh, case in point would be the public safety training and PSAP facility that you all just talked about, which is in its final design stages. We're also looking forward to implementing the new ViewWork software. Uh, we've put a, pushed a lot of data into the software already, uh, but are still working through uh, all the training and the, uh, setting up the system in order to uh, help it, help us use it as a tool in managing a comprehensive work order and asset management system. And finally, we already talked about the, the great return that we're receiving on our professional trades team. This kind of leads to uh, what we learned from the study and in-house of helping us to develop a blocking and tackling project plan uh, to, as we look at how we fund various different projects and what we need to, to plan for, uh, not just over the five years shown here, but it goes well beyond that. Um, we recognize that this plan is, is fluid and will change over time as, as some of the priorities change. If we have an HVAC system go down, that's where we're going first. But uh, we, we do want to make sure that we have a solid plan uh, over at least the next five years as to what this funding that, that uh, we've established with this internal service fund is to be used for. I won't go through a complete list, but you can quickly see the challenge in main managing and funding priorities across all the various departments from our core administration facilities to fire, police, streets, parks, libraries. Uh, these are just a few uh, of the bigger projects that we have going on for each of these facilities. And as well, I should also mention that this is not just capital projects, this is also operating r and so, so kind of a combination of both uh, what, what is involved in, in uh, operating repair and maintenance and also then some of the bigger capital pieces. Like the internal service uh, fleet and technology funds, uh, did, the centralized facility fund does ensure that the city is proactively managing 
uh, in maintaining our facility assets. It allows us to focus not only on funding the short-term R&M needs, but also to build up balances over time to fund the larger renovation projects. Uh, this fund was established in 2021 and the 2022 budget you'll see will reflect an ongoing commitment to maintaining and improving our facilities using this fund. In addition, investing in facilities uh, needs to be, uh, needs can be a great use of one-time funds for larger, larger projects that may lessen, not increase the burden on long-term operating budgets. So whether it's local government assistance funds or excess balances within other funds, uh, there are opportunities that we have to invest in our facilities. Some of the larger projects that are currently in the mix that I've outlined here are uh, the LA, the chiller at the law enforcement center, uh, as well as I just did, did discuss that uh, the street and parks campus main buildings both have uh, designs, street design is near complete and the parks design is underway as to how we could renovate and better utilize those spaces. So I'll end by repeating that, again, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and that overall our team is very happy with the progress we've made over the past several years. And with your support, we're looking forward to continuing to take good care of both our immediate and long-term facility needs. And be happy to answer any questions. Council questions? Council Brecky? Um, just have you talked about, um, you know, how you're going to keep a rolling list or keeping track of the items that are, you know, the, the number of facilities that we have and what, you know, what is put on the list and, you know, how, who decides that? That we are deciding as a facilities team, along with our departmental partners, we identify for each facility, we have identified a list of the, the top priorities that we need to get to. Sometimes it's department wants that are on that list, and sometimes it's critical needs. We need to replace an HVAC. It's like the, the chiller at the law enforcement center. It's creating all kinds of problems. We're putting more money into that every, every month, every year. Our team is constantly getting called to, to make repairs on that, and it's just it's, it's not effective any longer in meeting the needs. So it's, it's a combination of that. And yes, we basically have gone through every facility and we keep a running list of what are the top priorities. And then we're also looking longer term. And that's where, like the street campus, we finally came up with this. I want to say it was maybe earlier, it was later last year that we came up with this thing, saying, or even mid last year, that we were looking at all the projects that we had to do for the facility. We finally said, you know, we should just take, sit down and take a look at the bigger picture here in renovating this facility. I was actually more, and, and that's all valuable information too because it's of interest, but I was actually more like as you're developing the list of, you know, what is a city facility and, you know, how does it get on that list? How do we keep track of it? For example, when the parks acquires a property and there's a house on it, you know, who puts that on the list or is there going to be a process that puts that on the list? And then, you know, is that list going to be approved anywhere or published anywhere, you know, to keep us, you know, to keep us on top of all of the things that we have or that we acquire? Um, I'm, you know, just maybe it's less a question, but how are we doing it now? I mean, how, do, how are you knowing that you've got everything that's on the list, everything that you've got it, the full list? For, is that part of what you did? For what, yeah, that's part of what we did because that's where we used the study. Uh, to help ourselves get get centered on what were our priorities and We don't deal with all the various park assets necessarily that's on their side But we're, but we're hoping with this and planning with this new work order and asset management system that that will help us better Keep keep the list we we now know what all assets we have and that's a big part is is once you start to understand how many assets you have all the components, they broke down every single component within a city facility that we manage from facilities management and for parks, basically all the components of every park. And that's a valuable list to import into the software to then keep track of that. And then during the budget process, and, and we're coming up that we will be talking more about this in our budget presentations, you know, we do identify kind of some of the major areas that we are going, uh, that we are undertaking and making sure that uh, you also see them as contracts come through, but making sure that everybody is well aware of what are our major undertakings. It's not every single small repair and maintenance, 
uh, because we may, at times, we may change our, our mind on which HVAC system should be replaced first, as, as you have two competing HVAC systems that are aged out. But uh, it's, uh, it should be a, a good enough plan that will tell you, here's where we're going. Okay. So uh, a couple of a question, more questions than a couple of thoughts. Uh, first, I want you know, to applaud you for this undertaking, you know, to, to your office, to Sean's office for doing that. I actually see this, this is a legacy issue, I think, for this administration, for this council to undertake this, you know, through your guidance and direction. I also see a part in it for the council. If I learned anything um, in my years as a city attorney in implementing the form of government, if when I come back 14 years later, I, if I see anything that I've learned, it's that some far too often we didn't actually codify things in ordinance that actually kept them in place. And some of those things that just went away with the stroke of a pen because we couldn't, we weren't, we couldn't fathom the idea that anybody wouldn't want to do it that way. So I think that there's a place for the council in this, with you know, in some, in some, putting some mechanisms in ordinance so that once you get this structure in place, that it stays in place, um, unless there's a public debate on it, which would be again by by putting it in ordinance. Again, that policy setting role of you know, either adopting the list or um, um, adopting the process. Is it going to be, how, how is it rolled in conjunction with the CIP? Is it like a separate plan so that, that would be reviewed as part of the CIP? Right, centralized facilities has a part of the capital program and in that we highlight, it's kind of like this blocking and tackling plan that I presented up here. These are our first priorities and these will, these are highlighted in our capital program and in our operating budget these are our first priorities. So mm -hmm. we, do, we do put the plan into motion via, via the budget. We know mm -hmm. that there are some components of it that may change a little bit. In other words, which, which, fire, which of two fire stations we might remodel first, or which, which HVAC system gets mm -hmm. replaced first, or if it's a chiller or a boiler. You know, some of those things, we have a little bit of fluidity, fluidity to them, but the plan is laid out that Here's, here's some of the things that, uh, that we had on our list. One of the things that was on our list for a long time was the ADA ramp access to Carnegie Town Hall here. And that was on our list. That was part of the capital plan, and we finally got it done. So, so just they do kind of roll through the plan. Yeah, and, and, show and, up. and that's why I was asking about the CIP. You know, is it, you know, it's kind of like a, a subsection of the Correct. CIP. And, and I think I, I would just throw this out there and I would throw this out there to my fellow council members. I think there's a place in there for again, a memorializing that legislatively by requiring that it happen, requiring that there be a, you know, a facilities management plan, which is a subsection to the CIP. I'm just talking off the top of my head, but if you require it, then in the future, it, it won't just go away because somebody decides they just want to decide it themselves, and that's a good way to save money because if, if the administration, the mayor just decides, I, I, I want to decide, and I don't want to deal with all this stuff in the way they've proposed it, um, then again, that's the kind of thing that goes away with the stroke of a pen. You're doing a lot of work here, valuable work, and I think that codifying it would be very wise. So I, I would suggest that you consider you know, putting that in your final proposals um, so that we can pick that up and run with it from the council's perspective. And I, I throw that out to my fellow council members as I say it to you. I think it's important that we be involved. Thank you. Councilor Neitzer. I have a number of questions, so I'll just ask a, a handful and then I'll, I'll defer. And, uh, but I, I do want to reiterate that this is really important work and it is a marathon and it will be a marathon that never ends because obviously buildings continue to age and it's something that's it's it's not sexy because it's not a new building but it's something that's really vital um, and, and it's interesting that you listed these 39 facilities because that's the ones that you've identified as you know putting under your central centralized facilities but there's literally hundreds of small structures and park bathrooms and park shops and garages and random buildings that the city owns that may or may not be in this under this plan, but they're assets of the city. Um, so with that, one question I do have is, so you did identify 39 facilities. So 
how do you decide which facilities you're going to put under this and which ones you're going to leave under a particular department? Um, most of our primary facilities that are used to provide government services are under our plan uh, for in facilities management. Um, it's when you get into providing specific, uh, I would say, industry services. So like the parks, all the ancillary parks facilities are maintained by parks at this time. The water rec plant, we take care of the primary plant office facility, uh, but all the pieces to the water rec plant are not managed by centralized facilities, that's managed by water rec. Same with water and the other utilities. So at landfill, we'll take care of the scale house and the primary uh, office shop facility, storage, uh, warm storage facility, but it, it ends there. They're in charge of all their extra little buildings or, or pieces of, of that uh, operation. So like at Water Rec, you would take care of the main office building, which is Correct. just generically an office building, which is something that plumbers and carpenters could do, but yep. you're not in the business of maintaining a highly specialized Correct. clarifier that needs yep. certain training. Same thing with like parks. And and parks is, is a little easier to, would be a little easier to absorb some of the buildings, but uh, in general, they're very specialized in providing park needs. You know, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't have the size of the team or the bandwidth to take care of every park shelter, every, uh, uh, every park shop that's out there, every uh, uh, asset of theirs. Okay, and I don't see as an example, I don't think I see things like the event center and the pavilion listed. Is that because they're under third party management Correct. those agreements? Those, are, terms of those are run through the entertainment tax fund. Uh, we are still heavily involved from, from our office. In, in those facilities and, and maintaining, especially Scott Rust with our procurement office. Sean meets with them frequently, we're, and, and I'm in a lot of those meetings. So we're frequently meeting with them, and sometimes we will use our team to go help their team or vice versa, require, uh, you know, they have, like the pavilion has a very specialized woodworking carpenter, and so you know, we brought them in to evaluate our model we're doing at City Hall, and so it's, it's one of those things where you share resources. But those are, out of the entertainment tax fund and uh, and mostly uh, uh, part of our arrangement with the third party to take care of those, mainly using contracted resources. Okay. Uh, in terms of a specific job, you, you find out that a toilet's broken and you need to replace it. How, how do you decide what, what you're going to do in-house versus when you're going to just subcontract one of our local companies, plumbing, HVAC, or something like that? It, it really depends upon the scope of the project, the size of the project, whether we can efficiently do it in-house with our limited resources, uh, whether we have the skills available to do it, um, uh, whether or whether it's specialized at that point where we'd be better off contracting the skill out, um, <clears throat> and our bandwidth. You know, we just we said we can't we can't do everything. Uh, they could do a lot, but when you're doing a major remodel or renovate renovation. Uh, that gets very difficult to do with the size of our in-house team. Right now, our carpenter team is out at Fire Station 2 remodeling their, their bunk rooms and some of their living quarters out there. And they, it's, a, it's, a smaller, it's a station that, that's part of what we can do. Uh, we're doing a lot of the work ourselves and some of the city hall remodeling that we've done. But uh, when you get into a larger project, uh, say a street camp renovation or something like that, that's going to be the... Uh, uh, bid out or when we just don't have the bandwidth to take care of you know a couple emergency plumbing needs we have emergency contracts in place okay and last one for for this round uh, if um, the the fund itself so if it's an internal service fund it, each department presumably is there's a transfer going on that they're paying essentially into the fund Correct. Uh, but how do you determine how much each department should have to pay each year? And do they pay different amounts? Is it, I mean, how is this projected? How do you know? It's based upon the needs, you know, what we are projecting for needs for that department and those facilities that are under that department. So we look forward to the projects that are coming up for that department and plan accordingly. And that's how we started this fund, just like we do with technology and with fleet. We're looking at what does it take us long term, and we're just building into this fund. But uh, what does it take long term for us to take care of these buildings? And that's, we need to come get that money so that 
when the time comes, we are ready to build, uh, to uh, take, take care of that repair, renovation, remodel, uh, and as well as just meet the ongoing needs of, of that. So, uh, so in the future, so. you may see certain, certain projects, for example, let's say a chiller, like a law enforcement chiller, may not be its own CIP project. It may go under this internal service fund under its it is centralized under facility of improvements. It Correct. is under there. It is, it is specific under there. It, okay. If it's a project's big enough, we'll put it as a specific project. Um, and so that is a specific project on the internal service fund. And yeah. okay. it's being transferred over from the police CIP sales okay. tax. Okay, thanks. Councilor Erickson. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off of the same questions that Greg had asked. So what is that fund sitting at right now? What's the amount and what's the goal to be at? Is it... You know, we have a 25% goal of reserve that that we have imposed essentially on the administration to make sure that we have that percentage sitting there. Um, so I'm curious what that amount is and what the goal truly is. I'm sure it fluctuates from year to year. We're still working on the end goal. So that's a, that's a number that is in progress. We are trying to build this fund. Okay. And so we do have some growth. If you look today on page six of your monthly financial report, you'll see the facilities management fund currently has a balance of $837,000 in it. Gotcha. Uh, from, from transfers so far this year. Um, but this fund will be like the other funds where we will need to build balances over time and they will get spent over the time. Again, an internal service fund is technically a zero sum, zero sum game at the end of the day. What we bring in, we put back into the facilities. We are trying to a step for establishing appropriate reserves and building those balances to use for facilities. We are trying to build big balances up to uh, for for no reason. We yeah, are yeah. they're to very purposeful and and um, like I said, will be built over time, but will also be used over time. Right. No, and I appreciate that. I think that this is a fabulous idea. I know Councillor Jensen's talked about it a whole bunch with wanting really a big master list so we don't have those surprises again you know like all of a sudden last year you know we surprise we need to do the lion's den sorry it's falling apart and we have to put the money in right now or else it's a life safety issue and those are the things that we want to avoid are those life safety issues that we don't all of a sudden have to have our hands tied and say do it or someone might get hurt it's I, that is so frustrating when those things are coming forward, you know, it's like, oh, well, if you do this, you're gonna get sued, same thing. It's risk and reward with any of the decisions we make. And so it's making sure we don't have those surprises in the future, and so I really appreciate you planning this, getting it together. I know that there's still silos within each department and they have to plan, the parks have to plan their thing and other areas with the entertainment tax, but truly, feeding that all into one giant master list is so important for us. Um, so when you do have needs, if it's on that list, it's a lot easier for me to say, yeah, we knew this was coming. Maybe I didn't look at it every single day, but we knew it was on the list and we were planning for it instead of saying, hey, sorry guys. And I own old property, so I get crap breaks all the time, pipes burst. Well, you gotta fix it because you don't really have a choice. There's those unexpected um, expenses all the time that, that come up. And so I appreciate the flexibility within it too, but really cannot stress enough having that holistic list of, I mean, not to bring up another controversial one, but the Tut Hill House, same thing. You know, it's these surprises that keep coming up um, just by lack of planning maybe. And so having those, and I know th that's outside of really this list, but for me, those are really key items to making sure that um, they're just taken care of or what's the plan? Like, hey, we're just gonna let this go. I know we have some, some facilities as well that uh, we talk about leasing or even selling slash purging when it was the, ice, the old ice and rec building, things of that nature. And so I would be curious too, if we've got a list of those items that, hey, these are items that we want to lease or sell, or I mean, I know there's a few buildings being talked about downtown right now about potentially leasing to others. And so what does that look like for 
the administration as well. So I don't know if that's a component of it or not, and I guess I didn't really have a question. I'm just talking in circles, so <laughs> sorry. I'm getting well, the eye from Kurt. <laughs> well, I'll chime in and I'll say from a finance perspective, we don't like surprises either. I, I know you don't. <laughs> I know you don't. It's really hard to justify those sometimes. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but we are trying to eliminate the surprises. For yeah, our, and this is just facilities. a start. Yeah, and I appreciate that this is just a start of, of where you're going to get that, so, so you know facets that you're taking care of. But like I said, as you, the ball keeps rolling down the hill, if we can include some of those others in a separate master list so we just know what's coming, I think is really, really important. Um, you know, And a lot of those make it in the CIP, but sometimes they jump the list. And so those are the things that it's hard to justify for. Um, as far as, um, it's on page four of mine, I don't know what, what slide it is. The facility condition assessments 2016 and 2020, um, having all those identified and, and really the blocking and tackling project plan. Um, is that listed on our website? Is that is that is there somewhere that I can go and look at your list or is that just something that you are keeping That's what's internally? That's going to be pretty well put into the, which you'll see in the budget document. Okay. We hope we put a, a good enough plan in there to give some assurances that we're watching these things and what we're watching. Mm -hmm. um, it's just difficult, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, sometimes, you know, street plans where it's hard to lay one, two, three, four, five, this is the way we're going to go. Right. When all of a sudden you don't get right away or you don't get certain things to fall into place. So then you go on to the next one in the list or you start having problems like in our case with, with some HVAC systems that you have to deal with first. So you push those up over the top and take care of those yeah. and then come back to the next ones. It just has to be, we just have to recognize that taking care of these buildings is, is, uh, something that's, that requires us to adapt. Yeah. We have to balance the plan and then adapt as, as needs change because mm -hmm. there, there will never be enough money to, to make every, these, every one of these buildings new. No. That's just, that's not what we're, and, that's and, not what we're here for. And construction on old buildings generally cost a lot. I mean, a pipe breaks and you're replacing not just the little pinhole in it, you're replacing you know, two feet of pipe or whatever it is. And it's, it's a mess. All sad. I, I get it. I do. So thank you for this. I appreciate it. And I would just encourage you to keep rolling and keep building that database for all of the departments, um, whether that is all melded into one or what that looks like. I just, that, that is where I would go. Thank you. Thank you. Other Councilor Starr. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Huber, one of the things that we did about four years ago is take a lot of several of the positions in the facilities department and take part time positions, put them into full time positions. I'm hearing good things. Confirm that I'm hearing those good things and that it's easier to recruit and really take care of people. Uh, that was a very good move, um, especially for our custodial team. It is so hard to find part time help and then part time help that you have to train and then they leave, then retrain and then retrain again. And, uh, but people that actually care about your building, I've cleaned with some of them and they care about what they're doing. And uh, that has been a very good move to convert a lot of part-time uh, FTEs to full-time FTEs. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Neitzer. Uh, it, in 2016 or, or so, when, when you did this first one, I remember, and I don't remember if it was tied to it, there was a piece of software that we acquired. It was like Facilities Buddy or something like that. Something Buddy? Facility Dude is, Dude. The, is okay. the company. and okay. but, but our main goal is to long-term get into the ViewWorks Asset Management Work Order System. Yeah. yeah. So is Facility but, Dude, is that what's used to track all of the... Is that what is in that right now? Is that what all these assets are in, or not? Um, or is that something well, else? Well, they they would like to have a moved us moved into their asset system, but yeah. uh, we are moving them into ViewWorks from their exportable format. So we use them to do the do the study and the analysis, but we are, uh, to my knowledge, we aren't specifically using their software. Okay, you you we pretty, also use a. Yeah. Well, go ahead. You're going to put it into your own tracking system. Correct. But We're you're going taking into their the data. citywide. We bought citywide asset man, a citywide work order and asset management system a couple years ago. We're in implementation uh, 
uh, the implementation phase of that. And so our goal is to get into that central database that then will also have the park assets. We'll also have the other assets in it too as well. So you get a more comprehensive list. Even if it's being managed by different people, you're still using the same system as best you can. But it's there. We're, it's a phased approach to how we get there with this with this large system. So, but well, getting, that that was what I was driving at. Was I knew there was a system that we were at least doing some of this, and that we were going in the direction of getting to where all of them are in a system where correct. you could literally push a button and export and just give me a list of every single building that let's say parks. And you can parse it out by give me a list of all our HVAC units. Give okay. me a list yeah. of all of our give uh, give. Uh, I don't know, sprinkler systems, give us, you know, give you different lists of different components of a, of a building so that you can look at them and say, okay, which ones, which ones are, and, and also track your remaining useful life. Just because it reaches the end of the remaining useful life doesn't mean we're going to turn around and replace it tomorrow, but it puts our eyes on it and we start to watch it. Okay, and thank you. And the last two are, so Parks has potentially the largest list <clears throat> from what I've seen. The streets has a that, lot too, but Parks has a ton. That was a very, the study that they did comprehensively looked at every component of the parks. That is a very comprehensive list of park assets. And Correct. so how, how are you, they, who is going to take this enormous amount of data with literally hundreds of assets and start to prioritize? And is that gonna, I would assume that's gonna come out of the parks budget to, re to replace roofs on right. park buildings and all this other stuff? Correct. How, did, how is that gonna start getting implemented? Well, I mean, it it's probably already, already is. It, I mean, it's every year, but. We've yeah. already a long time, uh, several years ago, we've established these, these cyclic programs and have funded cyclic programs in parks to take care of the various different pieces, whether it's play court replacements or repairs mm -hmm. or parking lots and pavement, uh, field, turf, you know, lights, fences, every the various different components so they can start to break them down and start to address their primary needs. And then it's a compilation of their, their various different district supervisors coming together and outlining those needs and making sure. And what this does is kind of gives them some baselines to start looking at it afresh again to say across the system, where, where are our biggest needs? And, and thank you, and I, I apologize for that. I, I, didn't, I shouldn't give them the impression that we're not doing this already. Of course we are. Uh, but now we have a, a much more comprehensive list of all of the different assets we have so they can maybe better prioritize maybe some things that might have fallen through the cracks or, right. or just whatever and just prioritize better. My last question is, I think those reports also touch on uh, ADA accessibility potential concerns at any of, with any facilities. Is that under your purview, or will that fall under something else? A lot of them, for else, when or? we are doing major remodels, you do undertake, you know, making sure they are ADA compliant. They did raise a lot of ADA issues. Um, you just you, you need to make those those uh, those changes as as the opportunities uh, present themselves. And whenever we go into a facility, you start to look at your access and making sure that we've addressed them. Not all of our doors in City Hall are, are able to accommodate for ADA access. So can you get access to everything you need in City Hall, you know, in, in various places? So. And, and, and so like as an example, those reports even go into things such as parking lots and, and sidewalks and things. So it would be just one of those when, okay, a few years from now, you got to replace the, the, the driveway or the parking lot. That's when you say, hey, there was an ADA concern. Now is the opportunity to re-engineer it and to do it. Correct. to today's standard. Some of them are so. more proactive that you need to do it. It, sure. it, it yeah. needs to have access. And other ones are, uh, especially if they're historic, you've got to kind of work around it and make sure that you you do the best you can in providing it while you're keeping the historic uh, nature of your facility. So yep. it's a balance. But, uh, you know, and, and Streets has done a lot of that, taking on a lot of those projects. Parks has taken on a lot of them and continue to do so. And uh, they know there was a lot identified in, in our city facilities reports as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Jenna Brecky. Just one more um, kind of came up as I listened to some of the other questions. You know, when you use the 39 facilities, I mean, those are all kind of identifiable bricks and mortar facilities. But like when you get into the weeds and you talk about parks, you know, on their list, I mean, 
there, you know, what constitutes a facility? For example, you know, you've got the Japanese gardens or the Queen Bee Mill remnants. Does that constitute a facility? Are they on the list? Again, in the past, there's been, we almost lost the Japanese gardens because they just weren't on anybody's list and they, they fell in disarray. The pump house station, is that, you know, on the list? Um, That's all on the, those were all identified, and I could just go through it. It's got, um, bleachers and benches down to fences and gates and bridges and drinking fountains and and stairs and ramps and all of those components in the various different parks were identified and a lot of pictures added uh, for us to be able to populate our system with pictures of those and, and so that condition assessment happened so, as part of this process correct. that you really that was part of this study that they did they didn't just go into each park facility whether it was the shop or the shelter or the restrooms they went into the park specific and irrigation and and lighting and, okay. and all play courts. You know, they, they looked at all all of those. Yeah, excellent. And I'll and I'll use an example of, of one of the concerns, like the Sebe house that we just demolished. I mean, apparently that was given as part of a gift that we received out there at Great Bear. Um, you know, we just recently saw a photograph of a house the city donated you know, that to the Seacog and it was rehabbed and resold. And there was a nice little house out there um, that was never programmed, that was apparently never on any list, that was used to store stuff in, that fell into disarray, um, that, you know, could have been programmed as part of the park experience, or, you know, maybe it could have been rented or used in some way as part of the park experience, but just through sheer neglect, it fell into a state where it was. It just made more sense to demolish that than you know. Even I don't even think it was discussed about moving it and and getting it re, re um, restored as part of a rehab project. So that's one of the things I'm also glad to hear about that they really are getting into the weeds in those park properties and all of the assets that are contained in them. So thank you for that. Well, if we demolish any of the buildings on this list, we'll we'll make sure you know about it. <laughs> the, that these are our major facilities. So we'll, uh, yeah, some of those ancillary facilities of the past, but I hope they've identified most of them in parks. Uh, but again, that's kind of outside of, I thought I had, oh, where was our facility list? Way back at the beginning. Yeah, these are our core facilities. You know, in anything we do to most of these core facilities of major, you're gonna know about because they're, it's gonna be a lot of times a major deal. Um, if we have a major renovation, not the smaller individual systems approach, but, but and then for the parks ones, I think again, that's the budget's coming up. And uh, one of the things we've really focused on with parks is their R&M budget and making sure that R&M budget reflects these park assets. They are all assets of the city and uh, taking care of them is a big job. Thanks. All right, seeing no further questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was super dynamic. We were all yeah. on the edge of our seats. You can tell by all the questions. At Thank this you. part, we go into our public input. If anybody has anything public to say on the two subjects, the financial results and long-term care facilities, now is the time. Seeing none, I'm going to call this adjournment of this meeting. <laughs>